Dr. Pedre, thank you so much for being here. I know we've met a couple of years ago, and I'm so excited to actually be able to sit down with you on camera and finally and uh, <laughs> ask you all my burning gut health questions. How long did it take to schedule this? Like oh, like only... eight months or something. <laughs> yeah, between lots of world travel and whatever else, but. More formally, you are a board certified functional medicine doctor, uh, board certified in internal medicine, practicing here in New York City, where we both live. Um, you are international Spanish faculty at the Institute for Functional Medicine, um, certified in yoga and medical acupuncture, which I love, and also the chief medical officer of United Naturals and the author of Happy Gut, a book focused on the role of gut health in the microbiome. Very busy, lots going on. Um, so thank you for taking the time. First up, as I said, you're this functionally trained doctor focus on gut health, which in the grand scheme of medicine is a very new focus. Um, how did you come to be doing that? I'm sure it wasn't on your mind when you first decided to be a doctor, or maybe it was. Um, I almost didn't become a doctor because I had this deathly fear of needles and after I took the MCATs to go to medical school I had this complete like I'm not gonna say breakdown but I realized okay wait a second like I like everything about medicine but I can't be in the room with a needle I pass out like drawing blood getting a shot so I told my parents I went home after the MCATs and I said yeah you know this medical school thing I don't know if I can do it. You know, I was kind of chickening out. And of course they said, uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you probably sat, at, I think, remember that day we sat in the living room with my mom and dad and we talked for an hour and they pretty much convinced me that yes, you're going to become a doctor. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to put the elephant in the room to the side, which is my fear of needle and I don't know how I'm going to do with blood and all that. I started thinking about that and thinking, okay, how am I going to conquer this? And in my family, there was no belief system around taking medication for psychological ills. Uh, it was more like you figure out how to conquer your mind, like how do you master what you're feeling inside so you can be positive so you can feel less anxious whatever it is so <clears throat> i started doing research and came upon a book by dr herbert benson which has been a very popular book over the ages the relaxation response and it was well researched harvard how breathing can lower blood pressure can lower the fight or flight response and i started learning about the internal mechanism that was happening to me which was the fight or flight whenever I had a needle coming at me. And so I started doing all the exercises in Dr. Benson's uh, book. And that was so key for me because at the same time that I did that, I started doing yoga. I discovered Dr. Andrew Weil, his book, Spontaneous Healing. I read Dr. Um, Deepak Chopra's book, Quantum Healing. And this was in an eight month sabbatical that I had before starting medical school because I had finished college early. So I had time to just kind of go home, sit around, really start to think about these things and think, how am I going to conquer this so that I can get my hepatitis B vaccine series, which is required <laughs> to go to medical school. Oh my gosh. And so I spent the next eight months doing guided imagery meditation and really mastering that so that by the time I started my first year of medical school, I was meditating almost every day for 30 minutes. Basically, by the time I got to medical school and we were, you know, first year of medical school was so fast. I mean, one semester in medical school is like more than, it's like two semesters in college. It's like taking eight classes at once. And everyone knew me as the Zen guy. And I didn't reveal my secret. I mean, mind you, this is 95. And meditation is not really the in thing back then. So it, it's not that maybe I felt a little bit embarrassed as a 21 year old meditating, but I felt, you know, this is kind of out there. I don't know that I want to share it, uh, but meditation and yoga got me through medical school. And I knew when I read those books that the type of doctor I was going to be was going to be shaped by that and was going to incorporate that in some way. I didn't know where that trajectory would end, 
but I admired people like Deepak Chopra who didn't have a road paved for them, but paved their own path through it. And along that journey, I discovered functional medicine after I did my residency training. You know, I, I trained in medical acupuncture, then that got me into really returning to the idea of systems biology, so the body working as this balance rather than being broken down into organ systems, which is the way we are, learn as in internist, internal mm -hmm. medicine. So I went from a position of like, oh, this is your heart, so you take heart medication. This is your liver, so we're gonna take this medication for it. To be like, okay, how do we look at the body as a whole? And that's really the way I always wanted to practice medicine and was shaped by my experience before I went to medical school. So I, I almost think like I opened my mind before it could be closed by the Western uh, medical school training. And so the, the gut microbiome focus came when? That really started in about 2006 uh, when I, um, when functional medicine came into my radar and I started learning about the microbiome and all that and realizing then backtracking and thinking about what happened to me as a child uh, because I always had a nervous stomach which then became an IBS like situation and I had been on probably two or three rounds of antibiotics as a teenager every year for like five to seven years. My wow. immune system was shot. I mean, I would get sinusitis, bronchitis, pneumonia over and over. All the doctors were thinking my immune system is weakened, but really the problem was my gut. I had leaky gut. I had developed a sensitivity to gluten as well as dairy. Um, I was lactose intolerant, but also I was dairy intolerant, um, dairy sensitive, so sensitive to casein and, and whey. And it wasn't until I discovered functional medicine that I was able to go back and think about what had happened to me in my life. I had done certain things because I was always interested in nutrition. So I'd already in medical school started experimenting and took dairy out of the diet and noticed that I wasn't picking up as many viruses when I took dairy out. So I was always kind of interesting how a lot of things that I've learned have been motivated by my own experience. And that one was motivated by me wanting to hack, like how do I not get sick? And how do I not have to take antibiotics? Because I wanted to not have to take antibiotics. But it wasn't until I learned functional medicine that kind of made sense of my life and what had happened to me as a child and what I thought was my normal at that point. I was in my 30s by then, early 30s. Uh, what I thought was going to be my normal for the rest of my life uh, was not my normal. And I know there are a lot of people out there who have gut issues who just resign themselves and think, well, this is the way my body operates. And what they don't know is that that's how your body operates if it's not um, working properly, if your gut is leaky, if your microbiome is in balance. I had gone through experiments of changing my diet and stuff. Um, for example, um, when I first moved to New York City, and mind you, the, the food that they feed residents in training at hospital is not healthy. I've heard that, it's, I've seen that. It's crazy, you know, that there is this discord between Western medicine and the connection of diet and health. You know, so for our noontime uh, science lectures or presentations, they would serve pizza with Coke and Diet Coke. Maybe once a month there would be a salad. Maybe, but mostly pizza, which is basically makes you comatose when you've been working, you know, overnight shifts or, yes. you know, you're exhausted. And little did I know that that was poison for my gut. And when I started figuring this all out and I started um, doing experiments, uh, at one point I told my friends they weren't gonna see me for a month. And I went and, and bought organic produce, uh, cooked for myself, uh, stopped ordering takeout and no pizza, none of that and the change in my health was dramatic. 
So I've always been kind of searching and tuning into how can nutrition make us feel better? And really functional medicine for me refined that. So then I discovered uh, really the, the importance of the gut microbiome. And for me, interestingly, the patients that I found amongst the most challenging to work with were gut patients. Uh, because from the Western model, if you have IBS, you, you have like this umbrella diagnosis that seemed very amorphous and perhaps intuitively I thought could be caused by many different things. But in Western medicine, you use one or two or three different medica medications to treat this umbrella diagnosis and you don't really dig down into the roots to see what is causing what we are seeing because people can present with the same type of looking symptomatology but the underlying root cause can be different. You could have a yeast overgrowth, you could have bacterial overgrowth, you could have a parasite, you could have a mix of things, you could have stress affecting it, and I know we're gonna talk about that. So I became really fascinated with gut health and the patients that were coming in with gut because I just really wanted to figure it all out. And then with the new tool set with functional medicine, microbiome, all that, I started working on diet and working on how can we fix the imbalances in the gut microbiome, leaky gut syndrome. And before I knew it, you know, I was just doing what I enjoyed. I had become somewhat of an expert, you know, and I say in quotation marks because uh, I always believe there's more to learn and this is an evolving field, so you can't ever stop learning. Uh, but that part of the, my practice grew and that's what really got me um, passionate about gut health because I saw what dramatic changes you could make in somebody's life if you could affect their gut health. It had a ripple effect on so many other health issues and it's just something that you can make such a big difference in people's lives and that was then the inspiration for writing my book Happy Gut. I think that people talk about gut health daily because I do but that's actually not true for most people. That they sort of understand the basics of it. So. When we talk about poor gut health, is that mm. just an imbalance in good and bad bacteria in your gut, or could there be other reasons that somebody has poor gut health? When we're talking about poor gut health, you have to think there's many factors that go into that. So yes, there could be an imbalance between bacteria, but there could also be an imbalance with yeast, and there could be parasite as well. There could be one, two, or three different imbalances. Okay, so happening. if somebody has like three different imbalances, they're really struggling. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and if they have three imbalances, you can pretty much guess that the person has leaky gut. Now, overlaid on that is the way the in entire system functions. So when you eat, digestion starts in your mouth by chewing the food. The act of chewing and even the smelling of the food and the thought of the food actually stimulates your digestive um, juices in your stomach. You start producing hydrochloric acid that's going to be ready to digest the protein that arrives with pepsin, which is the peptidase that so breaks down protein. And right there is one place where things can go wrong. So if you're not producing enough digestive uh, enzymes or digestive acid, you have low stomach acid you may not be digesting your protein properly. And if you don't do that, then that creates a downstream effect through the entire system because we really need that stomach acid to be working for that first stage of digestion for, for many reasons, but even just to break down protein into its component amino acids, which then helps stimulate leptin secretion, which tells your brain that you are full, and that you've eaten enough. And so one of the most highly prescribed and even just over the counter, one of the, one of the most predominant medications out there are anti-acids, right? So people are taking medication or being prescribed medication that reduces the natural state of the stomach, which is designed to protect you from harmful bacteria 
and from yeast that inevitably is in the food that we eat. We can't get away from yeast in, in food. Sometimes you, know, you might be eating berries that are just on the border, but you, you're not gonna see, you'll see it when it's really moldy, but you're not gonna see the very early stage. So we constantly have to protect ourselves from stuff that may be coming in through the food. And the stomach acid is the first line of protection for that. If you're raising the pH of the stomach, so lowering stomach acidity, you're losing that, and then that creates a whole bunch of downstream effects. Another example is when you have leaky gut, you're not getting the proper signaling from the brush border in the small intestine. So, and for people who don't understand, brush border is like almost like an internal comb. It's the, the involution of the, of the inner lining of the small intestine. It folds and then it's got all these finger-like projections and the whole goal is to increase and create as much surface area as possible in contact with the food so that food can be absorbed, the nutrients can be absorbed. But when you have leaky gut, that brush border gets damaged and part of what happens with that damage is that you don't get the right hormone signaling to the pancreas telling the pancreas to secrete enzymes to help you digest food. So it becomes these cascading ripple effects on the system that then can lead to yeast overgrowth, can lead to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, all sorts of imbalances. And then the gut being the primary center for the immune system can lead to inflammatory signals that I, I say are system-wide. So inflammation that starts in the gut then affects the entire body and you start to see um, allergies, asthma, migraines, all sorts of issues that you don't think are related to your gut but are actually rooted in your gut health. That's a perfect segue to the question I wanted to ask you next, which is if you don't have traditional gut symptoms like you know bloating or diarrhea or constipation, how do you know if you have good gut health? How can someone figure that out? That is a tough question because in our modern world, unless you're eating super clean and you've never been on antibiotics before, you probably have a disordered gut. And a lot of people that may have disordered gut health are not necessarily aware of it. A lot of times it depends on your level of awareness of your body. You know, so I have patients who are bloated, but they're not aware that they're bloated. Let me give you an example of a patient case I had, uh, which can be exemplary of the fact that you might be manifesting symptoms that are outside of your gut, but are related to your gut health without having to have gut symptoms that you, that you detect. I had a patient come in who was from India and she had developed what would have been classified as an inflammatory arthritis. She had all sorts of autoimmune markers. Her joints were swelling up, she was achy, she was tired. Right before she came to see me, she had read my book and actually had started breaking out in hives, but had decided to start taking out some of the foods that I talk about that could be bad and inflammatory. So she took out dairy and uh, wheat. By the time she came to see me, just by removing those two foods, the hives had really calmed down. But she still had joint pains and achiness and this severe fatigue, but no gut symptoms. So I asked her like no bloating, no diarrhea, bowel movements normal. So, you know, normally you would say, fine, there's no symptoms in the GI system, so let's not look there. But I know that because the inflammatory conditions she was exhibiting and because there's such a strong connection between autoimmune disease and gut health, uh, knowing that 70% of the immune system lives and is all around the, the digestive tract, I told her, look, we need to investigate what's going on with your, um, your gut, your stool, look at, rule out parasites, rule out yeast, all that. Um, because we need to find what is the root cause for this inflammatory arthritis that you've been classified with like a seronegative arthritis of some sort. So no one knew they wanted to put her on steroids and she didn't want to go on steroids. So we did the stool study 
And luckily, because it doesn't always come up, but we found on this particular stool study that she had yeast and that she also had a parasite. Now we know these things are gonna then affect the gut barrier, cause leaky gut syndrome, and when there's leaky gut, you're gonna get more endotoxemia. So in other words, there's a part of gram-negative bacteria on the cell wall of the gram-negative bacteria that's released. They used to think it's only released when the bacteria die, but sometimes the bacteria actually secrete it into their environment. What happens with that is it is a hugely potent stimulator of the immune system. It turns out we have receptors for that particular particle. It's a, called lipopolysaccharide endotoxin. And those receptors are on the immune cells, but they're also in the liver, they're in the brain, and they're in muscle tissue. And the receptor turns on a cascade that turns on inflammatory signals inside the cell. So this is a really potent instigator of inflammation, which could explain leaky gut endotoxemia, why she would have this inflammatory condition with joint pains and joint swellings, and she did not have Lyme disease, so ruled out, you know, always ruling out other possible conditions. So we treated the parasite, we treated the yeast, we worked on healing her gut, and her inflammation disappeared. The joint pains went away. She kept, she basically made it into a lifestyle for her, changed her diet. Since then, I think over time we were able to bring back some fermented uh, dairy like uh, yogurt and she's been fine with that. You know, once you heal the gut, you can start to sometimes reintegrate certain foods in certain types of ways, like a fermented food. And now she's well. Fatigue disappeared, but she didn't have any gut symptoms. So, but the clue was she had other body symptoms. Right. So you're not gonna have, you know, if you're healthy, you don't have any joint pains, you don't have any gut symptoms, then likely you don't have to go investigating to see if there's a problem with your gut. But if you're a woman that, for example, gets yeast infections really easily, or if you just go on a round of antibiotics, you are immediately getting a yeast infection, what you need to think of is that you have a yeast imbalance. And even though the yeast infection is happening intravaginally, what it means is you have a pool of yeast inside your gut. And that needs to be fixed or that needs to be healed and rebalanced so then you don't keep getting yeast infections. So there's always clues mm -hmm. that something could be going on, but that's another example. You might be getting yeast infections, but you might not have any gut symptoms or not, nothing major right. that you would think of. Right. But you have to investigate what's happening inside the gut. So I asked the question because I have a father and some other people I know that get a lot of colds easily. Mm -hmm. and. I'm always trying to explain that this is really either just an, an inflammatory response to the foods that they're eating, um, or this is a gut problem. And well, let's, let's, a let's connect this. So I find this really interesting. So there's an embryological relationship between the formation of the gut and the formation of the airway. Now go into Chinese medicine and acupuncture, and the two are on the same energetic qi meridian. So they always interrelated gut health with respiratory health in traditional Chinese medicine dating back 2,000 years, which was based on observation. You know, so I find that really fascinating because then from my clinical experience and work with patients, when you fix the gut, you can improve what's happening in the airway. Now, of course, things are complex and there's internal and external. So if you're reacting to your external environment, in some way, you might have to deal with that. You know, For example, if there was mold in your environment and you're mold sensitive, that could be a trigger. But there's always the other flip side of it is your internal environment. And if you're already turned on high alert, uh, I used to say, you know, kind of like, are you in yellow, orange, or red alert uh, internally, then you're going to be reacting to stuff that's coming through the environment. And I'm an example of that because I used to suffer from spring allergies. Uh, I never knew what allergies were growing up in Florida until I moved to the Northeast and went through my first spring. And <laughs> it was like a faucet, eyes were red, sneezing. 
<laughs> like, what is going on? I never had this my whole life, but I'd never been in the Northeast and exposed to pollen and this type of stuff growing up in Florida where there's really only two seasons, which is hot and less humid, that's it. <laughs> when I fixed my diet, my allergies disappeared. Well, that's so interesting. And that's just a testament to what I've seen in my patients that the internal milieu, the internal environment affects how you react to your external environment. Mm -hmm. Because if your internal environment is this kind of constant smoldering inflammation, low-grade inflammation, maybe a little bit of leaky gut, there's food sensitivities, there might be some gut microbiome alterations, then your system is on higher alert. And again, thinking back to they're both our internal, the, the gut and the airway, that's where we have our secretory IgA, which is a type of immuno immunoglobulin that we secrete into the mucosa. And if the alert is set off in the gut, the alert is going to be high in the respiratory uh, tract as well. So that's how the body works. Just to make it simple and make sure I understand it, if you're eating the wrong foods or you are drinking too much or you're you know traveling too much or, or you're making it difficult for your gut to operate the way that it wants to and digest properly and it feels on high alert yeah. then you're going to be more susceptible to any little virus that might pass you by yeah you um, have to think like if you're maybe a bit inflamed and producing too much mucus because you're having dairy for example uh, you're going to trap more viruses in your airway and you're going to be more predisposed to an infection or maybe you're more predisposed to getting congested and then developing a sinus infection, uh, which could be viral or bacterial. Given all of that, I'm sure somebody listening to this is like, well, do I have a good gut? What's going on? So besides seeing a gut health specialist like yourself, for people watching this, what would you say is like the first one to two steps of trying to figure out how your gut is doing, you know, give it a report card score and something like that. I think you're asking about like direct to consumer testing. Uh, there's well that or an elimination diet or like yeah, some way to I mean, know. start with my book, happy gut and, and do the 28 day programs. That's, that's super easy, but even on a simpler note, uh, cause that's, that's a more comprehensive elimination diet. You could start with eliminating one or two foods and the top two that especially in the United States are problematic are wheat, gluten, and dairy. Those are the top two. And for some people, because a lot of times I get asked, well, if, if we take out cow's dairy, can I have goat dairy? And it turns out that there is a cross reactivity between them of about 50%. So in other words, if you're reactive to cow dairy, 50% of those people will also be reactive to goat milk as well. So we and, used to think and sheep too, or yeah, but sheep is less. Sheep is actually less than goat milk. And interestingly, okay, this is kind of a fun side fact. You may know the answer to this because you do a lot of interviews. Uh, but which milk is the least reactive to humans because it is the most like human milk? I think I know. Camel milk. Yes. <laughs> yes, I do too many interviews. <laughs> Actually, no, I, I read that. I know that. I didn't learn that from an interview. Actually, I have thyroid antibodies. Not very high, but I would like to have no thyroid antibodies. So I was reading about what helps, and, and uh, this was mentioned in the article I was reading. It's really big in the, the autism community, and with uh, children with autism, there's usually a um, high percent of them have some level of gut dysfunction going on, leaky gut or, or microbiome disturbances, and they end up developing food sensitivities. And there have been some studies showing that giving them camel milk actually helps uh, heal the gut lining and reduce the food sensitivities. Interesting. So it's really fascinating um, because of the, and I think probably the likeness to human milk that has also the types of short chain sugars, oligosaccharides that help feed and promote the good type of bacteria like the bifidobacterium in the gut, which are healing for the gut. You mentioned direct to consumer gut testing, like stool kits, like um, Viome and things like that. Do those work the same they as Stool I, I'm going to say there's a lot of controversy and honestly, 
between what is direct to consumer and the ones that I can use as a practitioner, uh, it's an evolving science, an evolving understanding. There was a study done um, a couple of years ago. It was published, I believe, in Cell, and they actually went in endoscopically and they did lavage at different levels of the digestive tract and looked at the microbiome that could be um, found through PCR, so through DNA testing, to see what is living there. Uh, you can't always find everything through culture because some things are anaerobic, which means they don't like living in oxygen, so they won't even grow in an oxygen environment. So it's, a little, it's very difficult to culture those anaerobes, uh, especially uh, there's a big a number of them that live in the large intestine. So just so, make sure people understand what that means. Culture meaning a stool sample. Culture meaning like they take your stool sample and then they put it on a petri dish that has some type of sugar that bacteria would feed off of and they see what grows. So then they look at the different strains that, that grow. So my point was that they took samples from different parts of the GI tract and then they compared it to a stool sample and they found that the stool sample wasn't always representative of what could be found in different parts of the GI tract, especially higher up, like in the small intestine. A lot of times you didn't see the bacteria that could be cultured or uh, actually PCR'd from there in the stool. I've heard that before. SIBO is sort of, because of that, a lot of people don't know they have it. A lot of people will know they have it and you can't um, reliably diagnose it from a, a stool study. Is there a difference between direct-to-consumer stool testing and mm -hmm. practitioner ordered there's stool a lot testing? Of, there's a lot of crossover. For example, there's a company, Sun Genomics, that is doing customized probiotics based on whole genome analysis of the stool. Wow. And they're using some sort of decision tool to help them figure out what probiotics to give. My only thing with that is then, you know, this particular study that showed that you're not going to find everything in the stool that is actually in all layer, all levels of the GI tract going up to the small intestine. So you could argue that it's not a perfect system, but we're not going to put everyone through a procedure where they have to get a tube <laughs> into right. their... I said a whole genomic seems quite invasive, right, compared to well, just a stool... <laughs> Test. Well, but even the, so you, you can do whole genome analysis from a stool study. Oh, okay. I didn't yeah. realize So that. they just basically looking at the entire cross the genome, they like break it down and then they look at everything that's present and they can identify different bacteria. And I've had patients who have done and used the Sun Genomics and they have all these bacteria that come up and still, I think we're learning how can we clinically use this? And will it help the person and will it be useful? There's also another company that's really interesting. They're out of Israel. They're called Day2. And I believe that they're also, I think they're direct to consumer. You can do it. What they do, it's whole genome analysis, but then they're looking only at sections of the, of the type of bacteria that in, are in the stool that have to do with the way that you process carbohydrates. And what they've found through research is that not every person with sugar metabolism issues or diabetes is the same. Some are more sensitive to carbohydrates from certain foods and some are more sensitive to other foods. And they think that it's related to the microbiome that's in your gut. So they differentiate what type of bacteria are in your gut. And they have some research showing that by identifying which bacteria there and which ones are going to produce more sugar from processing uh, the starches from different vegetables uh, or um, foods that you eat, that by changing the diet, you can lower blood sugar. Oh, wow. And that's really fascinating because we know that metabolic syndrome, which is a, the early stages leading up to diabetes, that it is not a disease of just the pancreas, it's not just internal, that it has to do with the microbiome as well. The people reversing type 2 diabetes are um, often doing so through diet, which really to me is just changing their gut. Microbiome alterations. Yeah. yeah. And also one big person who's treating diabetes uh, is uh, Dr. Fung and he's doing it through um, intermittent fasting, sometimes with 24-hour fast. 
And look, when you're doing an extended fast, one thing that you're doing is you're lowering endotoxemia. Uh, you're lowering inflammation because when you're not exposing yourself to food, you're not having that, that influx through the fat that you eat that can also bring in more lipopolysaccharide. There's something called postprandial, so after you eat endotoxemia, and there's a certain element of that that can happen to all of us. It may be more with certain foods like a burger and french fries and a soda and a milkshake versus if you're eating a salad and bowl of broccoli with it, you're not going to get as much endotoxemia and they've shown that in different studies. You talked about parasites, fungus, viruses, bacteria. What's the best way for someone to prevent one of these organisms mm. from kind of, or several of them from taking over their, their gut environment? There are certain things to do that if you can choose, it's better for your health. Now, the, one of the first things I will say is avoid taking unnecessary antibiotics. But at the same token, as a doctor, I have to say antibiotics have saved lives. And I've seen in my own patients where antibiotic was the only course that could be done or the infection was going to win. So I'm not anti-antibiotics. I'm just anti the excessive use of antibiotics. A lot of people get a cold, a little sniffle, and they go to the doctor and they say, oh, give me an antibiotic, give me a Z-pack just to nip it in the bud. But what are you really nipping in the bud? Most likely it's a viral infection if it's very new or it could be the flu and antibiotics don't work for that. Right. And you can use antiviral. My first point is avoid unnecessary antibiotics. The second one would be to stay away from antacid medications as much as possible uh, because that's going to alter your stomach acid and that's your primary means of protection food that's coming in. If you're having acid reflux, and that is the reason that you're seeking to take some sort of antacid medication or a proton pump inhibitor, which is the bigger class uh, that used to be only prescribed and now is also over the counter, then you need to look at why you're having it. You know, a lot of times what happens is people wanna have their cake and eat it too. You wanna be able to go out and have your chocolate cake and have your glass of red wine and not have reflux. Maybe you need to fix the diet and so that you don't have reflux heal the gut, and then you can tolerate those things. Those would be the, the two primary things, I would say. And then we know that gluten is an inflammatory food regardless of whether you have celiac disease, which is an autoimmune intolerance to gluten, versus what we call non-celiac gluten sensitivity, regardless of whether you have celiac, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, or you're normal, what they found in a study is that it increases gut permeability in all three groups. You're gonna have a worse impact if you're celiac, second worse if you're non-celiac gluten sensitive, but you would think the normal would have zero impact to gut permeability from gluten, but they don't. Wow. And it's potentially that if then you have the right genetics, you could evolve from being normal to being a non-celiac gluten sensitive, which is what I am, for example. So avoiding wheat gluten, especially in the US where there's such a high gluten content in the type of wheat that's used uh, to make bread and, fl and flours uh, would be the third point. Fourth point is about whether eating raw food is good for your gut or not. And I find that if a person has disordered gut, so they're not producing enough enzymes to help them break down food, eating too many raw foods can actually be really tough for their gut, especially like greens, like salads, things like that. They're very difficult to break down. They have thick cell walls and we don't have the enzyme power to do that, especially if the gut is, is not in good health and the microbiome is not there to help support that breakdown, then a lot of what I, what I do with my gut patients is I actually have them eat cooked vegetables first. The more disordered they are, the more cooked the vegetable, and as they get better, we can start going into steaming and not, not being as overcooked. But you have to think of cooking as the act of digestion outside of the body. The other way, thing that you can do sometimes with raw, and you may or may not get away with it depending on how healthy the gut is, is using a high um, speed blender and 
breaking down the cell wall than drinking it, that's a little bit easier than eating the raw vegetables themselves. But if your gut is not in good order, you've got to start with cooked vegetables and then slowly, that would be a sign that the gut is getting better as you're able to tolerate eating salad. And what would be the typical symptom? If your gut is, a, is not doing well and you eat a salad, you feel like it sits in your stomach forever, you can't digest it well, you get bloated, you get uncomfortable, maybe you get abdominal pain. And so that was four, right? So five is dealing with stress. And that to me, I call it the elephant in the room because a lot of people have a great deal of stress, but they don't really identify it. Uh, because it becomes part of their normal and they just get desensitized to the effect of stress on their gut. And honestly, from all the work I've done, you can have the perfect diet, you can do, you can take the perfect supplements. If you don't work on the mind and that mind-gut connection, then you can't fully heal the gut. Amazing. So within healing the mind to heal the gut, would you say some of the main tools are meditation and? Meditation is key. Honestly, doing anything that gets you into a meditative state, that gets your body into the parasympathetic state. It could be going on a hike in the woods. It could be going by a river. It could be, for me, it's going to the seashore and being at the seashore where the waves are crashing, that lowers my stress levels. It's getting out in nature is a big factor, but I also live in the city and I advise you know my patients, it's hard to get out into nature easily. So meditation, going to yoga class, painting, drawing, like playing music, like it's everybody has to find what speaks to them. You know, so I try not to be dogmatic and say, well, this is the only thing you can do is meditation. There's a lot of things that can be done that get you into that mindfulness state, lower your fight or flight uh, neurotransmitters, the epinephrine, norepinephrine, and bring your cortisol down. And if you don't do that, you can't fully heal the gut. You know, I have some type A patients who come in and they want to continue eating, living their type A life and they're eating the right food but they're eating it at their desk at work, rushed, doing other stuff. Like you cannot digest if you're not resting. You have to rest to digest and you have to be in this relaxed state in order to heal the body, not just the gut, but the entire body. I just uh, theorize that if you can't get into that parasympathetic state, which is the relaxed kind of Zen state, then your body is gonna be in this high alert and your immune system is gonna be on high alert you can't get into the recovery processes that allow your body and your gut to heal. So I can't emphasize that enough, that that is one key component that can never be ignored in gut healing. You can't bypass that by saying, I'm eating the perfect diet, I'm taking the right supplements, I'm seeing the best doctor, but still I have gut issues while you haven't dealt with the the mind uh, body connection and it could be also dealing with the emotions and things that you know we know that the gut is the intuitive center it's almost like we we energetically take in the world through our gut you can't bypass that in any gut healing protocol and I put that in my book happy gut because a lot of times people think like it's it's a diet program or it's a cleanse but it's actually a full mind body system to heal the gut you can't do it without working on the mind as well. The other thing I preach is gratitude, uh, getting out of negative thought patterns. Uh, so really getting into a space of expressing what is good in life when, because especially if you're just seeing everything is bad. And that works also well for health, like visualizing what your good health looks like and what it would feel like to be like that because a lot of times people can get stuck in this chronic ill mentality and you assume the persona of the chronic illness and you start to disconnect with the fact that there's a piece of you, the essence of you, that is not your illness, that is not chronically ill. Wow, so fascinating. Last thing on that, just because I'm such a visual person, can you describe the connection between, say, having like leaky gut and, you know, parasites and, you know, food sensitivities and 
high stress? Like how does, I know that there's something called the vagus nerve, like how does the stress actually yeah. impact what's going on in there? Absolutely. We know, for example, that if you are in a um, car accident or some sort of uh, collision where you get a concussion and you're knocked out, within 30 minutes you have vagal nerve malfunction and that malfunction actually causes leaky gut. So there is an effect, the pulsation from the vagus nerve that helps maintain the integrity of the gut border. And the vagus nerve is very sensitive to our, our modern lifestyle and stress is one of those things that's going to alter uh, vagal nerve uh, tone. So there is that connection, but there's also when you're in this hyper mode, this fight or flight state, it's actually like an attack on the gut and it increases secretion of zonulin and it causes the connections between the cells. You imagine the tight junctions, the cells are sealed like this and there's no space between the cells. So only the nutrients that can get absorbed through the cell can get through. But now you have the effect of stress or gluten or dysbiosis and imbalance of good and bad bacteria causing inflammation in the gut or stress itself kind of like an attack on the gut and that increases the space. So it loosens the tight junctions. So now you can see there are holes in between the cells. These are microscopic um, spaces, but they're big enough for then partially digested proteins to get through. And that's where we see food sensitivities start to evolve. And then the body doesn't react to amino acids, but the immune system does react to proteins and if the protein is a certain length of every protein is a chain of amino acids if it's greater than a certain amount of amino acids it's going to then look at it and say this is a foreign invader this could be a bacteria and it's going to attack it as if it is a bug that's trying to get into the body it doesn't matter that it's food and that causes um, again the whole cascade of inflammation that we've been talking about Wow, I've never had somebody explain the physical connection. Now I totally see it and get it. So thank you for that. Um, I know I have to let you go soon. So I want to ask one last big gut health topic that people, you know, write into WellBe about all the time, and that is probiotics, um, both probiotic food and then probiotic supplements. Mm -hmm. And basically saying, you know, I want to, or I, I might have a gut problem, or I want to optimize my gut. Should I be taking a probiotic and you know, what kind of different probiotic food should I eat? And I thought I shouldn't have dairy, but isn't that a probiotic? You know, there's a lot of confusion. And also yeah. the quality. Oh my gosh, there can be so many, I know. So many ways to break this so down. Should everyone be taking some sort of a probiotic supplement and or eating probiotic foods? Or is that really just for people that have identified a, a gut issue? I'm going to say that almost anyone could benefit from taking a probiotic at some point because 99% or more of the people on the planet have been on antibiotics at some point. As much as I don't want to be on antibiotics, uh, I had to go on antibiotics this year because of a infection around my tooth. So these things crop up and then I put myself on probiotics afterwards. And that would be the same advice that I give to anyone who's been on a round of antibiotics. You have to look at probiotics as transient residence in the, in the GI tract. They don't create a permanent residence, but they do alter the gut barrier. So they help with leaky gut syndrome and they also communicate with other bacteria that are in the gut and they can help promote the growth of other good bacteria in the gut. So in that way, probiotics can be really helpful. And along with taking, you know, I think part of a balanced diet is including fermented foods of different types. And the question is, you know, do I have dairy or do I not have dairy? It depends on, are you lactose intolerant? Do you have a sensitivity to dairy? In other words, you eat dairy and it causes some body symptoms. And the only way to discover that would be through an elimination diet, like the one in my book, Happy Gut. But any elimination diet where you take dairy out and then reintroduce and you have to be mega observant and see you know if, if you have some cheese when you're reintroducing does it cause a runny nose does it cause congestion do you feel tired after it like an hour or two later 
And you have to look for small details of that. And that could predicate whether you can have a regular yogurt, like say a store-bought store yogurt, or even better, make your own yogurt at home with organic grass-fed dairy or maybe with goat milk or even coconut based uh, non-dairy so there's a lot of different options and there's no one right answer for everyone so I, I'm always trying to give the information so the person can use it to then be their own doctor and because you know your body best but you can only know your body if you're paying attention I love that yes I tell people that a lot there's no one diet for everyone because everyone just wants the prescription there are commonalities there there are like general diets and we know that certain diets work well for certain things like I say to my patients being vegetarian could be good for some people for some people it isn't and I've had over the years patients change their dietary pattern becoming more in tune with what their body needs and starting to feel better I mean I have a patient who's a vegan who had a blog um, and a actually Instagram account that was all around her being vegan and then her iron levels were low and she was tired and I think um, hair was uh, falling out uh, or thinning and she started bringing meat back into her diet and she felt better iron levels started coming up of course that created outrage among her vegan followers but honestly you need to honor what your body needs and everybody's body speaks a different language and there are generalities but within that you have to find what is it that is suited for you the other thing I wanted to mention in terms of probiotics is that uh, you have to remember that a lot of the really the foundation for promoting a diverse and healthy microbiome is through the foods that we eat that are rich in prebiotics so it's the, the vegetables, it's the grains, but even bananas have prebiotics. Blueberries have a small percent of prebiotics. Chicory root has prebiotic in it. Jerusalem artichoke also. Tubers are really great, like root vegetables, uh, rich in fiber. They also uh, help n um, nourish and promote diverse microbiome. So you have to remember that, yes, probiotics are, have a place in health especially if you've been on antibiotics or if you have yeast overgrowth recurrent yeast infections but the other thing is is really the diet and what you're eating and making sure you're getting enough fiber in the diet to feed the microbiome fiber being the prebiotics that you were just talking about fiber is the pre prebiotics are basically fiber and fiber is basically uh, short chain carbohydrates so they're like sugars but they're sugars that we can't digest so they don't get broken down in the small intestine. They go to the large intestine where they get fermented by the bacteria and then they produce all sorts of byproducts that are really good for us. Amazing. How about quality of on the probiotics topic? Does that really make a difference? Is all kind of bifidobacteria, for example, the same or does the supplement quality really matter? I think that is something that we're really gonna get into is understanding quality. Uh, for example, I'm working with United Naturals uh, on a symbiotic that we've created and also a leaky gut formula. And one thing that we did is we sent the top 10 probiotics on Amazon to get analyzed to see if they actually have what they say. And I think it was about seven of them didn't have what they oh my said was on the label. Wow. So yeah, I mean, quality is important. Strength of the probiotic can be important depending on what your underlying condition is. So you might need a really high potency probiotic that is 100 billion, even all the way to 400 billion if you have ulcerative colitis or inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, so all of those factors are important. Does the company make sure that the probiotic blend is strong and has the potency that it says it has through the expiration date so you know that what you're buying is going to be okay because a lot of what people don't realize is that once it's manufactured it's a living product so it starts to decay over time and you start to lose the potency in the capsule 
So a lot of companies, what they do is they actually create, m put more in the capsule than what it, the guarantee is on the label. Say it's 30 billion, the capsule might start at 100 billion. The reason for that is because there's going to be decay over time and you want to make sure that there's 30 billion CFUs or colony forming units, which is the strength of the probiotic at the time of expiration. So that it's true that it had those 30 billion all the way, even though you, you know, most of the time you're going to be buying probiotics that are not expiring for another year or so. But those are considerations in looking at probiotics and do they need to be refrigerated? Do they not need to be refrigerated? If you travel, you're going to want one that doesn't have to be refrigerated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we could go on and on. <laughs> I've written about this and I feel like Every time I look at it, I feel like it's just, there's more to talk about. There's a lot of complexity and confusion, but I agree. I just, to simplify, um, at least what I do is I, I have a probiotic that needs to be refrigerated at home, and then I have another one that doesn't for, for travel. when I'm traveling. And, Which and makes a lot of sense. Right, and also I find when I'm traveling is when I'm potentially putting my gut in the most danger and also eating the worst. So it, some people say, well, just take it when you're home, but I actually find when I'm traveling is when I really need it the most. So that's important for me to and have that. And that is them. actually, that's a great thing for you to bring up because a lot of people, especially women, will suffer from constipation when traveling and having a probiotic with you during travel can help kind of mitigate that and also changes in water and, and food. There's different bacteria that predominate in different countries and sometimes that can kind of create a little havoc in the gut. Well, this has been so informative. I could have you here for another seven hours because I have so many questions and I think so many people do. Just the microbiome project has just opened everybody's mind to how much this matters for, for every part of health and thank God for people like you to give us more information because it is very complicated. The last thing I want to ask you is something called our Get Well Be Talks. So each expert or each person I, I interview, I, I want to know, you know, what are the absolute can't miss things that you do in a day? And it could be just one thing, two things, three things, whatever, that you do no matter how busy you are, travel, no travel, so that you keep yourself well. I Get Well Be by making sure that at some point during my day, I take deep breaths and it could be a pause between seeing patients where I just pause and I make sure and it's kind of like a moment of centering for me. It's in, in many ways it's a reset button uh, and I'll stop and I'll take three deep breaths. I'll stop whatever I'm doing. It could be in the office, something that could be in my commute to from work. Um, I use that if I feel like I'm kind of like amped up and I need to kind of ground and center myself. And that go goes back to the very beginning, which was the breath is what rescued me from my fear of needles. So I find it to be very grounding, but it's something that everybody has. You carry it with you, and it's an internal power of your body to create internal relaxation. And you can do it just by, by taking that pause. It's like, it's almost like that little moment, even just three breaths, it could take up to 20 seconds to take. Um, but it, it's a moment of the day that's yours. And for me, it's very centering. So. I love that. You're making me take deep breaths right now as I was listening to you say that. Because <laughs> I don't think I did today yet. Thank you so much again. I so appreciate it. I want to have you back for six more sessions so we can <laughs> ask all the follow-up questions that people will have. But glad to get you here now. So thank you again. Finally, such a pleasure to be here and to be with the Get Well Be community.